seeking relief from persistent pain. It's not easy when doctors don't believe you. I was not willing to accept that a full hysterectomy was my only solution. A patient takes control, finding a second opinion that fixed everything. Good morning, I'm Jessica Lovell. It is Friday, February 3rd. Welcome to the Morning Medical Update. Have you ever had persistent pain that you couldn't explain and doctors couldn't pinpoint what it was? Well, today we learn what one woman did to help herself and she hopes her story can help others. As always, make sure you get your questions sent in to us on YouTube, Facebook, and the Medical News Network. You can find links to those right here on your screen. You're about to meet a woman who was forced to become her own health advocate to avoid a major surgery she didn't even need. Alexis Del Cid explains how one woman finally got the help she needed with her own research and a second opinion. Right, like right it by that freckle. This small reddish mark on the right side of her neck is the only visible reminder of what Sherry Noller endured. Today I'm feeling great. I'm feeling wonderful without pain. The Joplin woman's journey began in June of 2021. I felt as though I had a constant icy hot feeling with inside my body. It was a pain that would radiate down through my left leg down to about my knee and at the worst of it would also be radiating up my left side into my rib cage. Even more maddening, it was a pain deep inside her. Sherry couldn't find it, couldn't relieve it with any kind of pressure. I was also feeling like my hips were just kind of out of joint a little bit. I was trying to stretch. I was trying to move around to get some relief and nothing would help. Over several months, she saw multiple doctors and had multiple scans and tests, everything coming up clean, indicating she was perfectly healthy. It impacted my mental health for sure. At 38, Sherry felt despair. Then she started doing her own internet searches and she came across something intriguing. Dozens of Facebook pages and groups dedicated to something she'd never heard of, pelvic congestion syndrome. In the simplest terms, varicose veins in the pelvis. What I found was a community of tens of thousands of women. She asked her gynecologist in Joplin about it and says she was stunned when the doctor told Sherry that she didn't believe in pelvic congestion syndrome. Even worse. The only way to remedy pelvic congestion syndrome was to have a full hysterectomy. Sherry took the reins, reaching out to a doctor at the University of Kansas Health System that she'd read about through her various searches, vascular and interventional radiologist, Dr. Adam Alley. Dr. Alley took one look at her CAT scan and validated everything. Sherry did have pelvic congestion syndrome, and even better, Dr. Alley could treat it quickly and completely. They would have to go through her jugular vein to do it. I'm thinking they're going in through my jugular vein. Right jugular vein. You know, that's a that's a very major vein. Yes, it is. Sherry Noller joins us now to talk more about this, along with Dr. Aaron Rohr, who specializes in both vascular interventional radiology and di diagnostic radiology as well. Uh, Dr. Rohr, how are you today? Great. Thanks Happy for Friday. Thanks for being with us, Sherry. We just watched your story. How did it feel talking to those doctors first and realizing they just simply didn't believe you? Uh, it was, it, you know, it really just kind of took my breath away. I had at that point in time been through a couple of months of different procedures and to know that I was feeling something, but then a doctor said that they didn't believe in it was, um, it was really disheartening and it, and it took a lot of wind out of my sails in terms of hope that I was going to be able to get relief. Well, and you ask these questions and, and you, you want to open up to your doctor and have that conversation. And we, we tend to believe what our doctors tell us. So um, you, you took this a step further, did your own digging around and found much more information. We're going to talk all about that this morning. And Dr. War, I want to talk more about what pelvic congestion syndrome is and, and who is most at risk. So we'll talk about that here in just a moment. But first, just a quick check on our COVID count with Dr. Tim Williamson, <coughs> our Vice President of Quality and Safety. Thank you for filling in for Doc Hawk on this Friday. How are you? Uh, great. Good to see uh, you. Good to see you. Good morning. Thanks Good morning. For, thanks for having me. So uh, our numbers are down a little bit from where we reported out on Wednesday. We still have 21 active, uh, five in the ICU and two on ventilators for a total of 46. So uh, just waiting to get back down into the, the teens and even lower than that would be great. Um, 
so not where we were, but still, of course, we want to get down to, to zero at some yeah, point. Yeah, we're still there, as, as we were just talking before we yeah. went, on, went on. Okay, so you are VP of Quality and Safety, so I want to ask you about a minor safety issue um, that ended up being a, a big deal here at the health system that ended up actually preventing harm to patients in facilities across the entire nation. It has to do with these gate belts. Here they are. Um, tell us what they're used for, first of all, and then what the change needed to be made. Yeah, I think this is a great story. And you think about all of the incredibly complex technology we have mm -hmm. in a health system and proton therapy and whatnot. This is a piece of canvas with some metal teeth that basically goes around a patient to help provide a place to hold and support them uh, with a therapist or a nurse who's trying to get them up from a bed or, or walk them in the hall. Because if you think about it, a lot of folks are in gowns, they don't really have anything to hold on to, and so that belt goes around them. And back in June, we had a patient who was uh, getting up, the therapist was holding on to that belt, and um, it, it slipped a little bit. The patient just kind of went down gently to their knees and no harm happened to that patient. But we teach, ask all of our new employees at orientation to be safety inspectors. We have thousands of people here and we want every single person to pay attention to things that could be a risk. And this person was very astute and they realized this belt, which is again just a piece of canvas, was thinner than, it, than, than they normally are. And so that um, the teeth didn't grab. And so she went and looked at other belts. We realized we had a mix of this new product from the manufacturer that wasn't <clears throat> as sturdy, for lack of a better word. Um, and so we used our patient safety kind of uh, response process, and we were able to use our supply chain, who was great. We swept the entire hospital and made sure that we didn't have any more of these. We pulled any of the thinner belts. But I think the bigger story is we reached out to the FDA. They have a process called MedWatch. And they were then eventually able to send out to the entire country this kind of alert that this could be a risk uh, in other places. So this was a therapist paying very close attention to a very simple piece of technology that impacted, and we got a certificate from the FDA, that team did, uh, recognizing them for impacting safety across the, the, the nation. I think that's really cool. So it something is. really simple, uh, but they didn't blow right by it paid attention, got all our safety people involved, got nationally safety people involved, and, and made it safer for patients. And that's what you get when you empower people to, to be looking for those things, because it's not a problem until it becomes a problem. And so you don't notice it until it actually happens, but it takes somebody saying, hey, wait a second, um, pumping the brakes, and then it, and it turns into something, like you said, a minor thing that turns into a big thing. So, um, so but, yeah. Be before there was harm. Exactly. So it was great. So it is a great story, and we're glad you're here to share that with us this morning. Uh, Dr. Williamson, stick around. We may have a couple questions for you from the community, but I want to get back to our guest today and Dr. War, who's with me here. And we do want to clarify that you did not treat Sherry. Um, that was Dr. Adam Alley, uh, who we met in the story just a moment ago. But explain what pelvic congestion syndrome is and, and who might be at risk at that. Yeah, this is one of the rare times in uh, the medical world where the terminology is spot on. So yeah. pelvic congestion syndrome is exactly that. It's congestion of the veins in the pelvis. Um, so the veins that typically uh, pump blood back to the heart uh, from the pelvis and the abdomen become incompetent is what you'll see when you read about it, which basically means they're unable to perform at the level they were before. And as you can see in the graphic there, the main culprits are usually the ovarian uh, veins in women. And uh, when they become incompetent, they're unable to get that blood back and then they get bogged down and they get dilated and then they start affecting uh, all the adjacent structures uh, in, the, in the pelvis, including the uterus, the ovaries, nerves, et cetera. Um, so the people who are most at risk for this are women. Um, uh, other risk factors include pregnancies, multiple pregnancies that come full term. Uh, other things such as varicose veins, spider veins, those types of things are also um, um, relative indications that this could be a, an issue. Is that hereditary? Hereditary as well. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, a lot of people who have it in their family tend to uh, reproduce that at later times and, and as well. You mentioned pregnancy. So is it just having that? Is it being on your feet? Is that pressure that's caused? Um... It, it's a combination of that. Um, as, as you can imagine, there's a lot more blood supply demanded on the body when you're supporting a child um, for full term. Um, so those veins require more blood to get back uh, and they have more uh, tension on the system, if you will, and they just become a little blown out and become incompetent and those types of things. So Dr. Alley and his team knew exactly what this was when he met Sherry. So why might other doctors not even think it existed? 
Well, I think it's a culmination of a lot of different factors, but um, one being it, it's pretty vague symptoms. So uh, the symptoms can overlap with a lot of other etiologies uh, for pelvic pain, and, and people can become unfortunately dismissive at that time. Um, the other thing is just lack of awareness. It's it's kind of a something that's grown throughout the medical community over the years, uh, where we now have imaging criteria and diagnostics to say yes, this is exactly what it is. Um, so it, it's a little bit of both, and and kind of overshadowed by uh, uh, some other vague symptoms that can be attributed to pelvic congestion syndrome. So Sherry, at, at first, the only option doctors were giving you was a full hysterectomy. You said no way. How did you go about finding Dr. Alley? Uh, tell us about the research, and, and this is kind of the, the good power of social media. Yes, and so um, at the point in time when I pelvic congestion syndrome came on my radar, um, I was going. I was seeing my general practice, uh, my general physician, and he was like, "Okay, we're at the time where I think you need to go see your OBGYN because." I've, I've exhausted all my options. And so in the time that I was waiting to get that appointment, um, I was listening to what the doctor was saying because what I was saying about where my pain was and what my pain was, um, my doctors were saying something different. They're like, it's your lower left quadrant um, abdominal pain. And so I started kind of using the words that the doctors were telling me and um, doing some Google searches. Um, when I came across either medical sites or um, in the, the particular case of how I found Dr. Alley through the University of Kansas healthcare site. Uh, then I went on to Facebook and I started searching um, the pelvic congestion syndrome. And that's when I found the various different communities. Um, and I joined one, not really knowing that this was what it, what I was thinking it was not, but really just kind of trying to go out there and see and hear from other women, what is it that they are experiencing? Is that something that I'm experiencing? Because I don't wanna just go off of a, an internet search. Um, so I was kind of, I was trying to do information gathering for myself uh, and understand, do I think I align with what some of these other folks are saying or do I need to maybe look a different direction? And what I found in the community that I joined was um, there were multiple different options. I mean, there were, um, nutcracker syndrome was one that came up, um, but pelvic congestion syndrome was one that was coming up. And in the posts that I was seeing, there were women saying, Hey, ask your doctor about pelvic congestion syndrome, because it may shine more light on what you're going through more so than, you know, this other, um, potentially this other diagnosis. And um, so I was reading that, I kind of stayed in tune to what that group was saying. Um, and then I had my appointment with, uh, with my OBGYN and um, that's when the idea of pelvic congestion syndrome was kind of dismissed. Um, and when this, well, I don't, I, you know, I don't, that's not really a thing. Um, I think we need to send you for second opinions and uh, do a couple of other things before we make a decision. Um, and that's what I did. I got second opinions and came back to the doctor with no answers um, that made sense and no answers from any other doctors. They said, this isn't a gastro issue. Um, you know, it's not any other issue. And so then my option was full hysterectomy or exploratory surgery. And, you know, at the time being 38 years old, neither option sound like a reasonable option to me, especially um, since I had been doing some research and in that in-between time was doing what I could to connect with uh, Dr. Alley and uh, the University of Kansas healthcare system so that I could get another opinion um, and be believed. I have to, I, well, and here you are, and we always say don't believe everything you read on the internet, certainly when it comes to 
to health and health care. But in this case, Dr. Rohr, I have to ask you, you know, she she knew something was up and, and did her own research. What do you make of that? And and when when can that work for someone really well? You know, it's not as uncommon as you think. Yeah. And, and when I see patients that have similar stories, such as yourself in, in my clinic, uh, the first thing I do is congratulate you because mm -hmm. I think the underlying theme here is uh, being your own advocate works really well in, in a lot of cases. So uh, um, kudos to you for, for going the extra mile and, and making that happen. But uh, it's it's unfortunately not uncommon. And, uh, um, you know, attention to detail and getting second opinions is, is always warranted. And uh, congratulations to you for doing that. Okay, so we saw that Sherry had a procedure that started in her jugular, and she even mentioned in her story, like, my jugular vein? I mean, that's some serious stuff, but it, it seems a very long way from the jugular down to the pelvic area. Uh, why go that route? Uh, that's a great question, and it truly is provider preference. Um, Dr. Ali and I uh, treat these uh, uh, patients with a symptom almost identically in that fact uh, that we go through the jugular vein. It kind of gives you a straight shot from the neck to the groin uh, versus it's coming up through the groin and doing a pretty much a full loop 180 U-turn there. So it gives you a really good foundation uh, to perform the procedure. Uh, we have a lot of long catheters and sheaths and, and, and fun stuff that uh, can get us there, so that's usually not as big of a deal, but yeah, it, it's, it can be daunting knowing that that, uh, all this is going to happen through the, the big vein in your neck. Yeah, right. Okay, so let's check out this x-ray from Sherry's case. Just kind of explain what we're seeing here. So this is uh, pretty much exactly what we were talking about. So up towards the top of the picture is towards the head or the jugular vein, and that catheter you can see is kind of dipping down into that coil pack. And so those metallic things all throughout the left side are coils throughout the ovarian vein, the one that we had on the, the graphic before. And as you can see at the top of it, you can... Uh, make out there's a little bit of contrast there on top of the of the coils. So that's Dr. Alley saying, okay, I've coiled this thing off. Um, it's completely embolized. It's no longer functional. And here's the contrast to prove it. Um, so that's what that's uh, kind of stating or showing after the procedure has been completed. Sherry, how are you doing today? How are you feeling? Um, once Is this behind you? And what kind of uh, future care do you have? Yeah, so um, it, it is behind me. The the pain, the persistent, consistent pain is behind me. Um, I am doing everything that I, I want to do, staying as active. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm able to follow my kids around to all their activities and sports. Uh, and it's, it's really something that I don't give a second thought to um, anymore. And... Yeah. Um, as I mentioned in the in the piece, you know, my mental health was really starting to take a toll because as much as I was trying to relieve my own pain through um, pain relievers or stretching or doing all of these things um, and not getting relief and then going through the, the different doctor's appointments, um, it was it was really taking a toll. And so I, you know, I didn't want to be as active, but um, I'm very busy. A lot of things going on. Uh, lots of stuff happening at work. I'm uh, I've got a high school freshman who's, you know, they're planning a, a big trip for next year. So I'm actively involved in helping get that going. Uh, I've got a nine-year-old who's running around to all sorts of sports. So, um, you know, there's, there's no slowing down for me now. <laughs> Doc, that's kind of just what you really want to hear, isn't it? Yeah, that's the music to our ears. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So good to hear. Let's check and see if we have any reporter questions on the line today. Let's get to our community questions, shall we? Sarah wants to know um, what recovery was like for you. Sherry, did was there, what was, were you down for the count for a bit? No, actually, after the procedure, um, I did stay in my room for a couple of hours just for monitoring, and then um, my husband was able to take me home. Um, so because, again, I'm down in the Joplin area, so because of the uh, our location being within you know two to three hours i was able to go home that night and um from one of the pictures you saw i had a large like gauze bandage on my neck um with kind of a, a big adhesive sheet to keep that in place and um that i was uh, supposed to keep on for 24 hours and just kind of take it easy for uh, two to three days afterwards, which really kind of meant no significant twisting and, um, you know, just watching my, my activity level. Um, but that's all that my, um, my recovery was. Um, and when I came out of the procedure, I immediately felt better. So I was pretty excited to get up and moving again, but I did take it easy. Um, but following that, I I didn't have 
uh, any significant follow-up. I followed up with Dr. Ali about four to six weeks after the procedure, and uh, since then have not needed any additional follow-up, and I haven't had any additional issues. I want to ask both of our doctors about this one. Ruth Ellen says, how can it happen that a doctor doesn't believe in a possible diagnosis that a patient asks about? Um, Dr. Williamson, she says, that troubles me. Uh, what, what advice would you have um, hearing a story like Sherry's? And when people hear that a doctor didn't believe them, not everybody would be as savvy maybe to do what Sherry did and, and hit the internet and be able to find groups. Um, what do you make of it? Yeah, I think it's, <clears throat> it's terribly unfortunate, and, and I, I take care of a rare disease called pulmonary hypertension, and I not infrequently have folks who have found their way to us because they were told they had other things or, or maybe not believed at all, I, as, as in this case. So I think being your own best advocate, which, which Sherry did, is mm -hmm. just fabulous. And um, I, <clears throat> I've done medicine for a while now, and so I, I one of my th my mantras is always to keep an open mind and explore and and um, and kind of help uh, explore those other um, possibilities that uh, that it might be. But you know we encourage everyone to do that. Uh, and but a lot of patients come here to the health system for that exact reason mm -hmm. is that they've not been able to get the answers uh, and their research has has kind of guided them to us. So that's. Unfortunately, or you know, fortunately for yeah. us, but unfortunately, it's not an uncommon phenomenon that people uh, come to us that, by that very pathway. Yeah, makes sense, Dr. War. I mean, I think patients want to lean on their doctors for answers, but they also want to feel like it's a partnership and they're kind of walking alongside uh, with their health care. Uh, just what what do you say to, to someone like Ruth who, who that is concerning when you hear that? No oh. one wants to think that they're not believed. Yeah, it is truly concerning. And, and to kind of piggyback in Dr. Williamson's thoughts, uh, it, it's unfortunate. Uh, it happens, uh, but it is good to build that relationship and, and team, if you will, with your own health care. Um, you know, there's no no great answer to why some people do or don't believe in certain things in that in that nature. But um, one thing we do know is that we see it often, and and uh, to echo some similar uh, thoughts, this is a big center. We see it. We have a lot of subspecialists in these areas who run into these things a little more often than than most. And so it, it's nice to be able to to share that uh, experience with patients and reassure them that uh, we're on the right track. Sherry, a question for you is: um, What was the physician's response who didn't believe you? Have you been back in? touch with them to say, aha, I, I did my own research and I figured this out on my own. Um, I have I have not gone back to that specific doctor. Um, I did go back to the practice because um, that has been my OBGYN practice. Um, and I did share my experience with the um, with the nurse that I saw and um, just just shared my experience and um, you know of course you have to update them on any new procedures that you had since your last appointment and so I just went ahead and I shared my story I shared what had happened and the experience that I had had in the office and um, the response that I got was well that's interesting uh, we're I'll have to do some more research into that um, and I will say Nothing too to your that. question yeah and to your previous question um, you know, it's, it was my understanding from Dr. Ali that um, the dilated veins that I was showing um, are very are quite common, but it's not common that everyone is going to have pain from dilated veins either. And so, um, I think that that probably complicates the issue a little bit mm -hmm. for for those doctors that have maybe seen it before. Um, but to understand that there is a segment of the population that. Um, may appear to have the same symptoms as another patient, but that patient could be having significant pain, whereas the other patient isn't. Well, Linda was just asking, is there, are there other symptoms of pelvic congestion syndrome besides pain that people need to be on the lookout for? Yeah, it, it, again, it's kind of a uh, overlapping syndromes mm -hmm. with a lot of different things, um, uh, pain, uh, bloating. One of the uh, hallmarks of pelvic congestion syndrome actually is positional pain. It's one thing that kind of separates it a little more from others where, you know, uh, gravity kind of does its thing and pulls this blood down into the pelvis and uh, that's when you become uncomfortable standing, walking on your feet all day. Uh, patients. Uh, uh, typically have the same story of when I lie down or, or I go in this position, I, I feel much better. And I don't know if that was your case or not, but uh, we typically see that a fair amount. Um, and that kind of helps us discern some of those. But yeah, it, it can be uh, pretty vague until you get some of these more specific teased out kind of symptoms.
A question from Jeremy, and I'll give this to Dr. Williamson, and, and we touched on this, but I think it's, I think we just kind of brought up a really good topic. Um, Jeremy wants to know, what's the most helpful thing we can say to our doctors that help them to diagnose when it's hard to tell what's happening? When you're the one experiencing the symptoms, but maybe not, maybe best knowing how to communicate that when, when it's hard to know what it is and there's no direct answer. What, what advice might you have? You know, that's a great question. I'm interested in Dr. Warr's mm -hmm. opinion as well as, as I, you know, I think um, just be as, um, as specific as you can about what you're feeling. And I get sometimes it's hard to be specific. Mm -hmm. You know, the, in my world, sometimes there's a lot of overlap between shortness of breath and fatigue and tiredness. And, and, um, and so just tell folks what you're feeling and, and really get all of those symptoms out there and sometimes they feel like they're not connected but maybe they are connected in, in some way. And then um, I, I do think there, there's parts of the population that are really worried about offending their doctor or making their doctor mad. But, but my hope is that most physicians and other providers would be open that if you need to seek additional opinions. I, never discourage if someone if I'm not able to provide someone answers or 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 having trouble getting to the to the right answer I'm I'm open for people seeking second opinion so I think uh, mm -hmm. certainly tell your doctor everything that's going on but if if you're not quite getting the answers or or feel like you're being heard even then then certainly finding uh, other providers mm -hmm. to to tell that story to is is very reasonable. And that's why we talk about our second opinions. I mean that's yeah. we either send people for second opinions or we often are the second opinion. Either yeah. way, we want those second opinions um, heard. Uh, we, you talked about the overlapping of different, uh, and it could be in all sorts of areas of medicine, but the overlapping of. Um, of different symptoms can be really confusing for a patient. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and again, it's it's more of telling your story, uh, making sure that um, uh, all your symptoms are explained. Um, imaging is reviewed uh, thoroughly. If you need second opinions on that as well, um, they all kind of come together. And, and to your point earlier that you made. Uh, you, an enlarged vein uh, in the pelvis doesn't necessarily mean you have pelvic congestion syndrome. It's, it's something we see commonly, but when you start putting those pieces together from the puzzle of, oh, they are having this pain, it is positional, we do have imaging diagnosis to say that there is enlarged veins there, then things start to come together a little more, and sometimes it needs more than one set of eyes. Uh, I'm going to give you last question, and you, you, you touched on a little bit earlier, but uh, Jared asking if men can get pelvic congestion syndrome. Is it called the same thing? Is there, could they get those enlarged veins down in yes. that area? Yeah, technically um, it, it is the same. So the same incompetent vein, the, the gonadal vein, so in the, in the woman it's the ovarian vein, which we showed a, a graphic of, and the men it would be the testicular vein, and that's called a varicocele. They present a little bit differently, but it's the same type of pathophysiology. But they don't get it as often? Correct. Uh, not as often as far as the pelvic pain associated with pelvic congestion. So rarely do men present with the, the prostate discomfort and some of the uh, pelvic discomforts that you would see, and it's more of a, a testicular issue that's treated independently. Really interesting conversation. I had not heard of this um, this issue, so I hope hope uh, other people learned a lot about pelvic congestion syndrome today. And, you know, Sherry, we appreciate you sharing your story with us. Um, I want you to give us your final thoughts, but we just had one last question about just your, your best advice for people um, um, you know, seeking answers and, and wanting to know more about about where to go. Yeah, and you know, my advice there would be um, do do the research, talk to people, um, gather information. I mean, one of the things that I was really trying to be careful of when I was doing internet searches and even when I had joined the Facebook group was I need to look at this through the lens of. Am I only reading and getting the information that I want, or am I reading to understand what others are going through or what this website is telling me? And I was also very cautious not to just click on any website. I was making sure that the websites I was clicking on were um, health and hospital organizations. Um, again, just, you, you've, we've heard all of the things about cli uh, um, patients Googling their symptoms and all of a sudden they come in and, and they think that it's worse than it is. Um, and so I was just really trying to be cautious and it's part of my personality as well where I, I try to gather more information so that I'm not just getting it from one source. Uh, again, to better understand 
is what I think that's going on is that what's going on and this has really been the only time where I um, have done that and it's it's worked out in this particular manner um, because when I've you know done general searches before or when I've had issues I've gone to the doctor and everything has been easily explainable um, so my advice is you know to be your to be your advocate you know to um, love yourself enough that you are going to put forth the effort to find answers for yourself, um, just as you would for your family. And I say that as a mom to other moms and caregivers out there, because I was really great at making sure that the rest of my family had their regular doctor's appointments and um, fighting for answers when answers weren't available, but I wasn't always my best advocate. And so just know that you're worth it as well and that you need to take the time to take care of yourself and um it was that was honestly a pretty empowering thing for me to go through and um and for me to just kind of journey through because um i i am one that i don't like to push back on my doctors i have a lot of trust in my doctors um but i was at a point where i i had to do more for myself um, so that's what I would advise others is just making sure that you're doing um, what you think is right for yourself. Great message. Sherry, thank you so much for sharing your story. We appreciate you. Dr. Roy, thank final you. thoughts? Yeah, it's tough to put it better than Sherry just did. I mean, that, that's, exactly, uh, that's exactly right. Um, it's a very powerful message uh, about being your own uh, advocate and, and being able to trust yourself and, and look in the right directions, yet not get misled. And that's, that's a lot uh, of, of, it's a daunting task, I guess I should say, uh, for a patient. Uh, and it's, it's a very powerful message that you delivered, and I, I don't have much to add to it. Good stuff. Thanks for being with us today. Nice. Dr. Williamson, good to see you today. Yeah, it was great to be here. And um, I, mean, I think Sherry did a fabulous job of, of navigating the uh, World Wide Interweb. I mean, the amount of misinformation we know out there, and I think the approach she took was fabulous. I just wanted to reiterate uh, a thing or two I think Dr. Rohr said earlier. Um, there are some of these things that are relatively rare, and but by being a place that sees a lot of the rare stuff from all over the country, that gives us that opportunity and having that multidisciplinary approach that we can work together. For me, these things, it's two, three, four, five different disciplines working together. So uh, that's why we're here, and, and there are a lot of great people taking care, great care of patients all over the country, but sometimes if things are a little uh, a little more rare, then th that's a great time to, to seek additional information, and, and that's exactly why we're here. That's what you do. All right, Dr. Williamson, thank you so much. Thank you to Sherry and Dr. Rohr, and thank you for joining us today. Make it a great weekend, and we will see you back here Monday at 8. Coming up Monday on the Morning Medical Update. You can't see it, you can't smell it, but over time, this silent invader is the second leading cause of lung cancer. I'm Jessica Lovell, coming up on the next Morning Medical Update. Missouri and Kansas rank high for radon. How high? What you need to stay safe and how to test for it, Monday at eight. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and open mics with Dr. Stein's podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.